say stop. Well, good morning. You know, we should really do a countdown to let me know when we're going to start this service. Oh, wait, we do. Welcome to Central Baptist Church. It's great to see all your smiling faces this morning. If you wouldn't mind, let's all stand and we will sing some praises this morning.
In and out of situations That tug of war at me All day long I struggle For the answers that I need But then I come into His presence and all my questions become clear And for that sacred moment No doubt can interfere In the presence of Troubles vanish Hearts are mended In the presence Of the King Through His love the Lord provided Place for us to rest, a place to find the answers in the hour of distress. Now there's never any reason to give up in despair. Just slip away and breathe His name He will surely meet you there In the presence of Jehovah God Troubles vanish Hearts are mended In the presence Of the King In the The Key. Amen. Thank you, Becky. In the presence of the king, that's 
So true, and that's where we need to spend our time, right? That's where we need to spend our lives, in the presence of Jehovah, in the presence of the King. Thank you so much for that song. Um, you know, as the person standing up on stage, you have no idea of what's going on behind you. So, sorry, you know, it's a little, we, we, we've had some connectivity issues with these uh, TVs for some reason. Last week, this one was going crazy all morning, so we just turned it off. And then Wednesday, we had chapel, and everything went fine. And then at the end of chapel, I said to Abby, I said, hey, I didn't even notice it, but, like, the screen just worked. So I thought, well, amen, the screens work their own issues out. But then they have a new one. But that's all right. All right, so Esther is where we are going to uh, be this morning. Uh, Esther chapters 3 and 4 are where we're going to uh, spend our time uh, this is, you know, the sovereignty of God in a messed up situation. Um, this is kind of what we, we talked about last week, how we can see the hand of God in our life, uh, in, in mess, even in messed up situations, especially in messed up situations. And this story of Esther is a uh, crazy story that has all of the mystery and the murder and the backstabbing and the mono, you know, maniacal plots and everything of a good Hollywood film or you know, even more likely a soap opera these days. Some of it seems to be so fetched, but it's a deep story in contrast that kind of shows the sovereignty of God, the uh, fact that God's will, it will be done and uh, the will of man, and, and the, the, you know, the, the struggle between that, apparently. Now, we know that it's not a struggle for God, that his will is going to be done. Um, interestingly, in the book of Esther, like we talked about, uh, the name of God is not mentioned throughout the entire book. Uh, the uh, prayer is not mentioned. It does talk about fasting at one point here that we'll look at today. Um, but praying to God, seeking God, looking to God, having God's name mentioned at all is not there. But throughout the entire book, you can see the hand of God. You can see the sovereignty of God. You can see the will of God being done over and over and over with people that are willing to be used by him. And today, it, that's a big point of the message. Um, but it, it's, it's great to see that. Last week we talked about Ahasuerus, who was a prideful king. He was the uh, king over the area there. He was very proud, prideful. He was proud of the fact that he was rich, that he was wealthy, that he had all this land, had all this property, had all these peoples, uh, had a great military might. And so he had this huge party, a six-month-long party, uh, which wasn't good enough. And then he had another seven-day party. Uh, and at the, during that seven-day party, it says that he was, heart was merry with much wine, which we talked about is a bad idea, right? Uh, nothing ever starts out, a good story ever accomplishing anything starts out with, my heart was merry with much wine. So we talked about how the Bible is very clear about not being fooled by wine, and it's a mocker, and that you should stay away uh, from that. But uh, we saw that after that time, he decided he was going to bring his queen, Vashti, and prove how awesome she was, too, and how beautiful she was, and how that, you know, and he was kind of like, you know, a brag that he was going to show off, and she just said, no, I'm not coming. And we saw that first point of kind of uh, the fact that there's a lot of things happen in this story that appear to be wrong or sinful or maybe not a good idea, but there's no moral judgment put on it in, in, the, in the book. Um, and so obviously we know that sin is sin, but the point of it is, is that even in uh, the workings of our lives, even in the workings of what we don't see necessarily God's hand in, especially in real time, that he is still working, that he is still going to get his will done, that what he has laid out is still going to happen. So Vashti refuses uh, the king's Wise men say, you can't have that king. If you let your wife get away with it, then all the wives are just going to go crazy and none of them are going to listen to their husbands and there's going to be an uproar and there's going to be a revolt. We have to banish this lady. She can't be queen anymore. We got to get somebody in there that's better for you. And so the king, in a moment of ignorance and pride, agrees. And so he banishes Vashti, takes her from her um, queenness uh, dethrones her 
And then we know from history that he goes to war, loses the war, and then as he comes back, it kind of we, we, when we pick up there in verse in chapter two, we see that he's sad and he's thinking about Vashti and all of his wise men start being, getting concerned again. They were like, "Okay, if we've made the if we have caused the king this sorrow, he's probably not going to like us a whole lot. So we got to come up with a plan." So they come up with this evil beauty pageant of which they are going to go around get all the young birds in the land, all the beautiful young virgins in the land, bring them to the king, and then they will go through this one year long uh, period of, you know, cleansing and being purified and beautification and, you know, the whole spa treatment. They'll get to spend one night with the king, and then they'll go live with the rest of the concubines and just become one of his property. Horribly sinful, ridiculous thing that he's doing here, uh, but this is, this is the world that, that he lived in, and this is the power that he had. And the only way that, uh, that he would ever call that person back was if he found a lot of pleasure in her. He liked her. And so we see Esther. We're introduced to Hadassah is her Jewish name, and then uh, her Persian name being Esther, which means star. And she's introduced. And then her cousin Mordecai, who's also her adopted father, is introduced to the story. And so through this passage, we see that Mordecai tells Esther, hey, keep that whole Jewish thing quiet. Don't tell anybody that you're Jewish. Now, we don't, once again, we don't know why that is. We don't have the moral background to it. We can't say it's right or wrong, um, you know, but once again, even though we can't see it, God has a plan and God is using it. And so uh, she wins the beauty contest of Will. She, she goes in. She has her night with the king. He loves her more than all the other ones, and he calls her back, and then she becomes the queen, and he loves her more. And then closing last week, we saw that Mordecai um, saved the king's life. He was in the king's court, probably given the position once his cousin became the queen, um, and, and he is in the king there, or he's in the uh, gates there doing what they do for the government officials. He overhears a couple guys plotting to kill the king. He tells Esther, he tells the king, and Mordecai saves the day. You would think everybody would be happy about that, but it seemingly goes unnoticed except for the fact that God has a plan for it. And so it gets written in the king's diary, which foreshadowing, we said, would come into play, which it does today. So we will pick up in chapter 3, verse number 1. I know I'm talking a little fast, but I'm trying to get through two chapters. <laughs> so here we go. Chapter 3 of Esther, verse number 1. After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence. So now we are introduced to Haman the Agagite. Um, Agagite, that's a fun word to say, isn't it? Kind of, kind of sounds like I'm hitting pause there for a second, but... Uh, Haman is the bad guy of the story, right? He's the guy that we uh, all hate, that we can't stand. This is the guy, the evil guy in the soap opera that when he comes in, the music gets real menacing. And uh, we see that he's being promoted. We don't know why he's being promoted. Through the rest of the story, we kind of see he's got some money and probably some political sway and some power there. Uh, but he's the one being promoted. We ended with Mordecai saving the king's life. And now we have this guy coming in and, and um, getting promoted. Now, we don't know a lot about him. It says that he is an Agagite. Now, Josephus, who is a uh, Jewish historian who was not a Christian or anything, but also through context, says that he was one of the Amalekites. Uh, the king Agag, Agag was a popular kind of um, title, kind of like Pharaoh would have been in Egypt, uh, for the Amalekites. Uh, and the Amalekites were descendants of Esau that were the enemies of Israel, right? So Jacob and Esau had their, their feud. So, uh, and we look at, we'll look at a couple chapter, a couple verses here in, in Exodus chapter 17, uh, verse number 16, it says, For he said, Because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So the Amalekites and the Israelites from generation to generation from generation are going to have 
a uh, battle that, that's never going to end. Kind of like the Hatfield and McCoys, right? Um, and then in Deuteronomy 25, 19, it says, Therefore it shall be, when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about, this is once they come into the land of Israel, in the land which the Lord giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, thou shalt not forget it. So the direction that God is giving is that when you get into the Israel, when you occupy this land, get rid of the Amalekites. Destroy them totally, blot them out from the history book because that was what the Lord wanted. And then we see in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 3, this is instruction coming um, to Saul. Now go, who was the king at the time, now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not. But slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. So the direction given to Saul in this story is to wipe them off the face of the earth. Right? Get rid of them. They're evil. Their descendants are all going to be evil. Stay away. Blot them out. Make them go totally away. And then we'll see in verse 9 of chapter 15 what Saul really does. But Saul and the people spared Agag. And the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fatlings, and the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. So Saul said, you know what? I'm smarter than God. I really want this cool stuff. I really like these animals. They look pretty nice. So I'm going to keep all this. So we see that he keeps a portion of the Amalekites alive. King Agag um, is, has been allowed to stay alive. So it seems like, we don't know for sure, but it seems like, historically speaking, that uh, Haman is a direct descendant of these people that are mortal enemies with the Jews that have been allowed to be remain because Saul made a bad choice. But we also see that the hand of God is still in these situations. You see the will of man saying, hey, you know what? I'd rather have money and riches and the nice sheep and all this kind of stuff. But we see that the will of God is still going to prevail. And then we see that Mordecai would not bow to Haman. Verse number three. Then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said unto Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Now it came to pass, came to pass when they spake daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matter would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. So now his co-workers are coming up to him every day. Hey, how come you won't bow to Haman? How come, how come you won't bow to Haman? How come, you know Haman comes in and he, you don't bow to him. Why is that? We, once again, we're not really given a moral judgment on why Mordecai would not bow to Haman. Now, in, in Sunday school, we would probably say, well, it's because, you know, the Jews didn't bow to any god, you know, except for the true god. But this was more of a reverential kind of respect that, you know, was something that was done. So we don't know if maybe it was that. We don't know if maybe the fact that Mordecai knew that this was a blood relative of the Amalekites who hated Israel and that they were moral, mortal enemies. Maybe he just didn't like Haman. Maybe Haman was just a jerk. I'm guessing that there was a pretty good chance of that. Once again, we're not given any uh, moral judgment on what was right or what was wrong in this situation. But we still see the hand of God uh, working in this. Uh, maybe Haman claimed some kind of deity like the king did. I don't know. But either way, we see the hand of God working in this messed up situation. Verse 5. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had showed him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. So we see um, Haman take this a step further. He finds out from all the co-workers there in the gate that Mordecai is not just a jerk that won't bow down to him, but he's also one of those Jews, a mortal enemy of his ancestors. And so he's like, you know what? I want to kill Mordecai, but more than I want to get rid of Mordecai, I want to get rid of all those Jews. Hatred, anger, wrath, um, things that are not a good idea, right? Uh, this is a man that loved the power, loved the honor, loved the prestige of the whole thing. And, and he was more concerned about what he looked like in the king's court than what needed to be done. 
I saw a quote from Aesop that says, um, a fools, fools take to themselves the respect that is given to their office. Fools take to themselves what is given to their office. And that is true. We see that all day, every day, right? Whether it's po politicians, whether it's in the political world, whether it's at your work, um, whether it's in religious institutions, at a church. You know, we have a respect for positions. We have a respect for a, a president. We have a respect for congressmen. We have, because of their uh, ability to lead, right? And, and because their position requires that respect to some degree. But Haman has taken this respect that he's given as the second in command, and he's thinking, I'm awesome. Look at me. And when there's one guy that won't give him the respect, he's full of pride. It just makes him mad. And just getting rid of that guy is enough. He's got to wipe out everybody. Verse number seven. And in the first month, that is the month Nisan, in the twelfth day, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast Pur. So he's casting lots. He's kind of rolling dice. Uh, before Haman from day to day and from month to month to the twelfth month, that is the month Adar. So he figures out uh, when he wants to pull off this evil plan um, and so he's got, he, he rolls the dice and he says, okay, next year, it was about a year away, we're going to pull this plan off. We're going to get rid of all the Jews. Verse number eight, and Haman said unto King Ahasuerus, there's a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed amongst the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom, and their laws are diverse from all people. Neither keep they the king's laws. Therefore, it is not for the king's prophet to suffer them. If it please the king... Let it be written that they may be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it into the king's treasures. And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and the, and the, which were the Jews' enemies. And the king said unto Haman, The silver is given to thee, the people also, to do with them as it seemeth good to thee. So Haman, in his evil plot, says, Hey, there's these people, doesn't name who the people are, and they're always, they're everywhere. If you look out, they're everywhere, and you don't even know who they were. But they are diverse people. They're everywhere. And they don't listen to your laws. They have laws that are different from your laws. And if you let this go on, king, it's going to be bad news for you. Now, Haman through all, of, or I mean, um, Ahasuerus through all this probably isn't really thinking too much about it because he's awesome. He's prideful. He thinks he has a powerful kingdom. He's probably not too concerned about it. But Haman gets to the crux of the matter, right? He says... I will give you 10,000 talents of silver. Now, that sounds like a lot, sort of, right? But let's put it into what we, some, some context there. The total annual income of the Persian Empire was about 15,000 talents of silver at that time. So he's giving him two-thirds of their whole kingdom's income in one fell swoop. Now, if we do the math on the, well, let me tell you that. If we trust Google to do the math on what 10,000 talents of silver from then is today, then we are talking about $336 million. Not a light sum of money, right? Haman is like, king, these are bad people. You want to get rid of them. And also, I'm going to give you a big check. <laughs> and, 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 you know, the king caring more about his wealth and his pride. Here's my ring, make it so. That would be like, you know, a signature that we would say, a presidential signature on the paperwork to wipe out these people next year. I don't care. He didn't even ask who they were. He didn't say, hey, well, just out of curiosity, what are they? Who are they? Do, you, do they have a title? Like, do I know any of them? Doesn't care, right? This is him just being foolish once again, caring more about money and the things of the world than being a, a good Christian or a good leader, even not even a Christian, obviously, just, just a leader, just caring about his people. He doesn't care. All he cares about is the money and the pride and all that stuff. And, and you know, it, it makes me think like how horrible something like that would be. I hope that we never as a country face something like that. We've seen it throughout the world and throughout time. Probably the closest thing that we would have to it today would be, you know, abortion. 
um, you know, not protecting the unborn in our society. And, you know, and it's a sad situation that we live in that, you know, and there's some laws that have, that have improved that. But we as Christians, it's our responsibility to stand up for life. Right? It is our responsibility to stand up for uh, the life of those, especially that can't defend themselves. And so it's, it's, it's a sad case when people are more worried about their own will, uh, except for the will, even just for the people, but obviously uh, doing what God would have for us to do. Um, it's our job here to be reaching across um, all the disagreements and, and you know that, that we have with people, our society tries to make everything uh, you know you're either all good or you're all bad, right? You're either Trump or you're Biden, or you're either um, you know love everybody or you hate everybody. Like we we draw these lines and and it fractures our society. We can't be a part of that. We have to realize that it's our job to love God and love others, no matter what their belief system is, no matter where they come from. I mean, Jesus, we just talked about at Easter a couple weeks ago, he loved those people that were actively killing him. And that's what we need to be doing as Christians. Truth without love is brutality, but love without truth it's hypocrisy. And this was a plan of Satan here to try to wipe out the Jewish people and to keep Jesus from coming to be the Savior of the world. Verse number one of chapter four. So now we, we, we're shifting gears back over to Mordecai. And when Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud voice and a bitter cry and came even before the king's gate. For none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews, and fasting, and weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So the news goes out to the entire kingdom that what's going to happen next year. And and Mordecai hears about it and he's sad, he's upset, he tears his clothes. He puts on sackcloth. You know, that really uncomfortable thing that you have to wear. And and when you're wearing it, I'm sure we all have a piece of clothing like that. There's like that annoying tag that just won't go away, right? I mean, it's like you just, no matter what, you just can't be comfortable. Well, they wear these sackcloth to make sure that they don't, feel comfortable, to make sure that you know that they're upset. And they sit in the ashes, and and he didn't come into the king's gate, because if you make the king sad, then you're going to die. But he lets it known. This is probably some kind of a plea for Esther uh, to know what's going on, to find out what's going on. Because Esther doesn't know what's going on. She lives in her own part of the palace. She's not um, privy to all of this information. And so Mordecai is trying to make sure she finds out. And in verse 4, it says, So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told her, Then was the queen exceedingly grieved. So she's upset now. And she sent, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai and to t- take away his sackcloth from him, and he received it not. Then called Esther for Hattach, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend upon her, and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. So Hattach went forth to Mordecai under the street of the city, which was before the king's gate. So Mordecai's upset. Esther sees that he's upset, hears that he's upset, says, here, here's a nice new suit. You won't have that annoying tag. Everything will be good. Put this on. You'll be happy. And he says, nope, I'm not going to do it. And so she sends another guy out, a guy that she trusts. And she says, find out what his problem is. Why is he so sad? And so he comes out and he asks Mordecai, Um, what is going on? And so verse number seven, and Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him and of the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. Also, he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther and declare it unto her and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him and to make requests before him for her people. And Hattach came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. So now we have Mordecai 
who is Esther's adopted dad, who is grown up, you know, she's grown up with. And he says, let me tell you what's going on. That evil Haman, who I made mad because I wouldn't bow down to him, is upset with all the Jews. And he wants to wipe us all out. He's paid the king $336 million in order to get the right to wipe all of us out. Esther, you need to go talk to the king. Don't you love it when people tell you what you should do? (laughs) I get that sometimes. You know what you should do. No, please tell me. (laughs) But Mordecai says, Esther, this is what you should do. You need to go talk to the king. You need to find out what's going on. You need to make supplication to him. You need to beg for our lives. This isn't good, Esther. And so Esther, in verse 10, says, And again Esther spake unto Hattach, and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court, who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter that he may live. And I have not been called to come in unto the king these 30 days. And they told to Mordecai Esther's words. Esther's like, hey, good plan, except for, I kind of like keeping my head. (laughs) You know the rules, Mordecai. It's not like I can just go, hey, king, Will you help me out here? I wish it was true. But if you come in the door and he's not ready to see you, he'd just "Ah, kill them. Now he has a golden scepter, so if he tips it to you, you'd be saved. But like, you know how this game's played, Mordecai. You know who this king is. He is very impulsive. You know what happened to the last queen? She got banished. She's not the queen anymore. I don't think this is a good idea, Mordecai. And now we're going to come to the most famous passage of Esther. This is one that uh, you hear quoted all the time, and this is one that you have to truly think about and let sink into your heart. Because this is what it's all about right here. This is the point of the entire message. Verse 13. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews? For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? So Mordecai gives Esther that The answer, this is the one that you hate to hear, right? This is the one that someone says, hey, you know what you should do? And you go, yeah, please tell me. And then they give you the good reason. You're like, ah, I was really hoping you wouldn't be able to give me a good reason why I should do what you want me to do. But Mordecai tells her, don't you know you're in as much danger as I am? You think that just because you're the queen, you're going to escape this killing? that's going to happen. You're not going to get free of it. You're going to be just in the middle of it, just like the rest of us. And he said, plus, what's going to happen is going to happen. He goes back to the covenant that Jews had. He said, listen, I know that we are going to be preserved as a people. God's made a promise. He didn't say that, obviously, in those words, but this is what he's conveying, right? God has made a promise. We are his people. And as we've been talking about on Sunday nights, God's not finished with Israel. He said, I know we're going to survive. We're going to survive somehow. Something's going to happen. God will take care of us because that's the promise. But do you want to be in on what God's doing? Or do you want your, king, your, your family's name and you and any kids that you may have to be wiped off the face of the earth? Because it's going to be saved, but you won't escape it. You know why you're here, Esther? 
You know why everything that has happened that's seemingly messed up and put you in a horrible situation and you've had to put yourself in bad situations over and over and over again, be part of this horrible uh, beauty contest, you know, go into the king one night, think that you're going to be, th- now you're living in, you know, a separate part of the house and you're part of the king's property. He, he, sometimes he calls for you, but a lot of times you just hang out. You know why you've gone through all of this? Who knows? For such a time as this. We're all in here today. I don't know why. But God does. He brought you here today for a reason. He's going to take you out that door somewhere today for a reason. He's going to put people in your life that you might not understand. You might not even like those people a whole lot. But you still got to love them. And he does it for a reason. We don't always know what that reason is, especially in real time. When we're going through cancer treatments or we're going through watching someone go through cancer treatments or we're watching our loved ones or ourselves going through bad times, we have there's no way we could put reason on it sometimes. But God in his sovereign will has a plan. He's working on you. He's working on it. And there is a moment that if you allow yourself to be led by the Spirit, you know for such a time as this. This is why God has me going through all this messed up situation. So that I can help the person I'm sitting next to. So that I can edify so that I can build up somebody else in the church that's going through something similar. Because that person won't listen to anybody but me and I can help them and I can minister to them and I can share the love of God with them and I can present the gospel message to them how the fact that Jesus came to this earth to live a life, to die on the cross so that you can live forever with him for such a time as this. Mordecai says, Esther, God's going to do it. Do you want to be part of what God's doing? Or do you want to be wiped off? Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. Go and gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me. And neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. And so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. She realized what she needed to do. You guys know what you need to do. God doesn't hide his plans from you. Now, you might not want to hear them. You might plug your ears, put your head down, close your eyes, turn your back. But you know what to do. You know what the Spirit is telling you to do. You know what His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, (laughs) that lives in every single one that's accepted Him as their Savior, you know what He's calling you to do. Maybe you haven't accepted Him. (laughs) You know what He's calling you to do. It's the will of the Lord that all should come to know Him, that all should come to repentance, that all should call upon His name, that all should be saved. Esther realized, I know what to do. Fast for me, she said. And I accept it. If I perish, I perish. There's nobody in this room I'm willing to guess at this point in history. God ain't asking any of you to perish. She's doing something that could cost her life. God probably just wants you to tell somebody about him. A lot, lot less severe consequences for most of us. But you know what it is that he's calling you to. Are you going to be used? She knew the laws. She knew the impulsiveness of the king. She knew there was a chance she might never make it out. But if I perish, I perish. It was her attitude towards it. (laughs) 
Get in on what the Lord wants to do. He wants you. He wants you to be a part of it. He's calling you. He wants you to have a relationship with you. So badly that he sent his only begotten son to die for you. So that that relationship with him can be repaired, can be fixed. So that you will never have to spend any time without him in your life. Esther calculated the cost to her and her family. And it was severe. But she set her priorities on what God would have for her to do. She called on her prayer warrior. She called on the people that she was in community with to fast for her. And then she determined a course of action set forth by the Holy Spirit. Spoiler alert, she took action. We'll cover that next week. God's going to do what God's going to do. Are you going to miss the opportunity to be a part of it? If everybody stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed while Gary come play. A song of invitation for us. Calculate the cost. The Bible says a wise man knows what the building's going to build, cost before he builds it. Right? Calculate the cost. Set your priorities. And if Jesus ain't number one on that priority list, go ahead and redo the list. Ask for help. That's why we're together. That's why God brought us to this building together to accumulate as a church. The people, not the building, the church, the people, we could be anywhere together. We're the church. He called us together to help each other. Determine your course of action and follow Jesus' leading for such a time as this. I don't know what this is for you, but you do. (laughs) Are you going to listen to God? Are you going to be a part of what He has planned for you? Or are you going to bury your head? You're going to try to run? You're going to try to ignore it? That path doesn't end well. Take a moment and do business with the Lord. If you need to come forward, come forward. The altar is always open. If you'd like to talk to somebody, we'll make sure we have somebody that can talk to you. But if you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, if you've never put your faith in Him as the Savior, your Savior, that's the most important thing you can do today. If you have, but you're not following him, take the first step to following Jesus. You don't have to do anything in order to come to Jesus. Just come to Jesus. Let him work the rest of the details out. He'll do it. He already knows what your details are. He's already got a plan. Are you going to be a part of it? All right. Well, I trust that the Lord has given you something today. I hope that you wrestle with it all day and do what he would have for you to do. The first thing is the blessing that you'd miss out on if you're not back at 5 o'clock tonight for for the family craft night. So I hope to see you all here tonight. We'll go ahead and dismiss in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time. We thank you for your word, Lord, and what it means to us. I just pray that you would uh, be with each and every one of us, that we would uh, let your um, word penetrate our heart and, and affect us in a real way to not only hear what you have, but to follow your leading and your guidance, Lord. I just pray if there's any here that's not saved, that they would come to know you, Lord, and that they would continue to grow closer uh, to you and in relationship with those around us, Lord. We love you. We thank you. We ask all these things in your name. Amen.